think I know we call them lakes, but they are actually storm water retention ponds. And we're all familiar with those. I have a few slides here that shows how they build them. They take a land and they just <laughs> rip it. They move all the dirt around just to make these ponds. And the, this is actually an engineering uh, concept that has to be respected by the water management district. They require for these collections because all these impervious water surfaces are going to be collecting water, controlling the volume. And at the end, you end up with a pond, which is a golf course sometimes uses for part of their work. And people, the value of the properties increases when you have a backyard pond. Um, so this is basically what it is. And we're all familiar with that. So now it's part of your participation. Um, which, by the way, if you want to uh, scribble or have a piece of paper, um, we're going to be presenting. So what are the biggest problems you have experienced in your ponds? And we have a list of those here on the left. And there is um, erosion, fish kills, excessive aquatic vegetation, lack of littoral vegetation, water quality, harmful algae blooms. So these are the things that we have collected. There might be others. But let's concentrate on this. And what we're going to want to do is to tally them. And as we tally, and you can now start sending in the chat the name of the word that you see um, on, on these choices that here. And Molly will be collecting that information. Now, I don't want to just have a dead zone here. I have a video that we have, I have put together for to show a little bit of entertainment here where we allowing us to answer and also to see some examples of different ponds and different problems. Uh, you can see most of these are right now erosion. They have littorals that are, mm, depending on where your pleasure is. These are actually uh, shorelines that have been uh, images of places that are really serious erosion problems. Um, golf courses have sometimes experience that. So I'm, basically what, we, what I'm doing right now is just giving time for the tallying to happen. And once I get the tally, then we're going to go back to and see the results. So most of these, yeah, are uh, now we switching now from the erosion into littorals. Uh, what a difference the, with littoral plants. Littoral plants, we advise always to put them because they protect the shorelines from erosion. They might be still seen, but they can last, uh, make the erosion problems minimized if you keep and maintain those littoral plants. Um, so we have a few examples of that here. And um, these are, by the way, views with the drone, help of uh, our drone department here in the Hyacinth Control District. And I don't mention the, the locations because uh, some of them has amazing uh, work with littorals like this pond here, a great amount of different type of plants that has been with a fountain. But you can see there's a a, a very secure shore, a shoreline has been with this pond. And other views from above showing different approaches that they have. Sometimes the plants are doing well, but you see the wind. The wind that you see in the, the trees are moving. The wind is always prevailing in one direction sometimes, and that really eats up the shoreline. How are we doing? Oh, and then we have also the, yeah, the flowers are fantastic ways to hide maybe or enhance the shoreline. All right, so we're almost there. Pickerel weed is one of those plants that are very common in these things. Even if, and in the, again, fountains, they could be a great asset. Um, birds, wildlife, love these sites. Uh, and one thing that I actually I heard and I think is very important is habitat for not only big animals, but also for smaller animals like fish. And there's a lot of invertebrates that live in these in littorals, which control other organisms. This, uh, um, if you enhance the fisheries in these kind of ponds, you will get the advantage of having control other creatures like mosquitoes and not, um, other type of um, weeds problems. Okay, so with that and finishing that, um, Molly, are we okay? Okay, she needs one more second. And then what she's doing right now is gonna be putting everything in a spreadsheet that we can actually see the results. And uh, what I'll do is, 
Okay, I'm gonna wait, be patient on that. Um, we will be visiting some of these subjects that we have here. We already have a, the next announcement for the next one is gonna be about erosion and actually pond designs. We're gonna be talking a lot of issues about erosion. That will be our next webinar. The other one is gonna be about um, not so much harmful, oh, I'm sorry, littoral plants. There is definitely a presentation present coming up about littoral plants and their benefits. And in the future, done. All right. So in the future, we can address the algae blooms in general, microscopic and you know microscopic. So I'm going to switch now to the to the tally. Of course, I need to open this. So it's a one man show here. So <laughs> so I am trying to get the um, moving this away and then open the pond problems. And the spreadsheet that I have has been tallied and we'll be looking at the results. <clears throat> okay, so I have this and then now I'm gonna share the results with everybody. Um, hmm. Okay, let me go to my, part is okay so i guess i had to start again let me oh let me stop this sharing and then go back to sorry about this okay here it is yeah i needed to do a little bit of dynamic so now you're looking at a spreadsheet that has a tally of all the different problems and they are in the same order that were presented maybe. i don't think we're seeing it ernesto so let me do this. Let me go back to share. Okay, how about now? Now, now we can see it. Okay, what I did is I, I drag it out of the, the field where you have it. So now you can see it. And it's actually um, a tally where you have it, the same issues that we have, harmful algae blooms, water quality. And then it seems like the most is the lack of littoral vegetation. Um, four out of um, all the participants is the most erosion has a big issue there i can see that so erosion and harmful harmful algae blooms those are three major ones and i think definitely we definitely gonna have to address those other order uh, water quality and fish kills has been the minor and excessive aquatic vegetation and that we're gonna have to probably find out a little more about what do you mean with that because it could be uh, maybe beneficial plants or maybe non-desirable plants like exotics and we'll get to that but i'm glad we have this tally and i'm absolutely sure that we're going to be covering these topics later in future um, webinars so back to our powerpoint uh, blah, 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 blah. where is the powerpoint i thought it was this one okay sorry for oh here okay share okay so now we're back into this one I'm gonna to advance to, can you see this? Um, yes, we see it now. Okay, great. So this next activity actually is actually, I'm also participating you guys. Um, we have put the, uh, 10 different ponds pictures and we want you to select the number and you can be several. It is, you can have multiple selections here, uh, but select the number and each, not right now because I'm gonna be presenting each one of those pictures later on I and mean, we're going to see more details about that but the idea is that there will be a number associated to this picture and you pick the ones who most resemble your pond for example i got this pond number one and number two here present i will go in each one of those and we'll go all the way to 10. so you can be writing those in a number and eventually you can uh, you're going to send it as a chat what numbers represents the pawns that most resemble your pawn. And then Molly will be tally those and I'll have a video that, you know, to, to kill time while she can do this job. So this pond number one has no littorals, but it has pretty much clear water all the way around. But then number two, no littorals, but it has filamentous algae. And that filamentous algae is, is obviously there as, a, as an issue that can be addressed. So these are two of the ponds that I want you just to present, number one and number two. Number three and four has a different scenario. Uh, no littorals again, but there's erosion issues that has happening here, uh, little birds there. But the second, the pond number four has littorals, 
a lot of littorals, and you might see a different type of littoral, maybe too many to make sense of, but then there's a little bit of a scum. You see some, a little bit of a filamentous algae growing in between, but not only when I point it out. <laughs> so those are pond four and three and four. Five and six, littorals, nice garden, a nice beautiful lawn, and it is a nice garden around. That is a, a nice, healthy scenario where number six might have riprap, which is rocks that are holding and protecting the shoreline, but no littorals and um, no filamentous algae at this point. But then the riprap is present there. The number seven and four has a feature that is fountains. Both have fountains, but one has littorals, and you can see them abundantly. The other one has a fountain, but no littorals and some erosion issues there that we can see and a nasty pipe in the middle of, uh, of the pond which is probably the intake for the fountain. Then so nine and 10, these are the last ones. Uh, littoral shelves, very nice and beautiful. They also have a bubbler. And that bubbler you might see here in the little, in the middle of the lake, the pond, like pond. And we have uh, some nice littorals. And the other one, the bubblers are present, but there's no shoreline, there's riprap or a tiny gravel holding the, the, road, the, the edge of the pond. So those are the 10 ponds. And what we're doing now, we're gonna wait until you can send those numbers to um, and via chat and you can uh, take your time and you just send it out and then Molly will be growing, going to and tallying those. So right now you're looking at a video that I put together a long time with some, um, a, uh, another pond watcher, allow me beautiful plants that they, they have, this is our cannas, golden cannas, and you see a little bee hanging in there. That's, so this is a, a typical stonewater pond, but they have enhanced this pond with littoral plants. They plant them, this is a Sagittaria there, beautiful, nice shoreline. Of course, the water is high, but I did something else. I put the camera underwater to show you what's happening under this beautiful the, display of plants. Underneath, you see, can see the water's clear, first of all, and you see fish. The fish are just loving that area. So because they're able to find organisms, little bugs, and then that's how they keep themselves very nice and healthy. And, but the pond has this scum or the filamentous algae growing attached to or close to those littoral plants. Well, to be quite honest, those littorals are supporting this filament is big. Look at the fish. Oh my God, it's beautiful there. <laughs> so the, the filamentous algae are the ones, it's the one who is removing nutrients, who's making the water clear. That's where the most absorption that from the nutrients is from that scum or that filamentous algae that you see associated with the littorals. That's where the, the, the beauty of the littorals is. Not for the plant itself, that the plant is not removing the water nutrients, is the filamentous algae associated. The plants are rooted. Now, there will be some, but it's mostly the, the filamentous algae and the, the periphyton growing around the plant. The plant just serve as a support for that type of filtration. And, um, and this is almost at the end of that. And of course, Joanne Justice is looking at me, what are you doing? Get out of my pond. Yes, ma'am, sorry about that. But thank you very much for allowing us to do that. And I'm going to go to the next slide, which basically has the results. I want you to say, wait, <laughs> my assistant is saying, Whoa, wait, because she's still tallying, which I, I got to understand it. That's a lot of work, but Molly's good. So um, I would like to probably present uh, or have an opportunity to, instead of me talking and talking, I would like to hear anything that Karen has to bring up that I haven't. <laughs> so, well, you know, there's just a lot of people have sent us their pond numbers and then um, someone sent us Pepper Tree Point Pond with Bubblers. Our problem is three on one slopes for the banks built in 1973. Mm, so maybe maybe we could comment on slopes. Slopes are, are we, one of the, the, the issues. A lot of the slope has been changing throughout the years. In fact, even the, the, the permits to dig a pond in, in 20 years ago, 
yeah, 20 years and I've been <laughs> working here. There was no limitation on how deep the ponds can be. Now they put a limit, a cap, no deeper than 12 feet, the ponds has to be. And if you go deeper than 12 feet, you have to put a fountain or an air, a type of an aerator, not a fountain, but an aerator to keep the ponds destratified, which is happening when you have a deep pond. And you know what, Ernesto, we have Andy Tilton on the line, and he might yes. be able to say something to it as well. And Ernesto, you, you stated all that well. Uh, the older ponds, uh, even if they were supposed to have been built with uh, four to one side slopes, uh, a lot of times they have, over time, changed and, and have steepened by one or more uh, operations being done around them or, or not being done to them to maintain them. And so that becomes a, a challenge to fix those slopes such that they're more stable and uh, also don't uh, take away real estate from behind somebody's house or under somebody's house. Uh, that, that is a challenge and, and each site may take a little different look to, to figure out the best way to fix those. Yeah. Yeah, Back. I'm, I'm so glad that you're participating here too. So do you want to take one more question before we go to the results? Because I have one. Okay, yes, let's do that. So um, from Marlene Rodak, is there a way to easily tell filamentous algae from bad stuff? That's a great question. In fact, um, yes, let me take that one because they are different type of filamentous algae. There's some of them are uh, green, and one of the examples is uh, sparogyra. It's a green algae, but there are also some blue-green algae, uh, filamentous as well, limbia. And those two are different kind of a type of uh, filamentous algae. Uh, and those are, depending on the source of nutrients and the, the type of nutrients are, they're gonna be proliferating depending on the nutrients that are available. Uh, there's another type of algae, which is I the one to bring up, is the, the blue-greens. And these are suspended single cells that are floating. Sometimes they cluster in a, in a group that will be microcystis, and those can release toxins. And I want to bring that up in, in a future uh, conversation. There are some also filament, uh, microscopic algae who are not as detrimental as that, that creates a cloudy turbidity. So these different type of plants have a different type of um, nutrient requirements, and they produce different type of problems. But yeah, we can address that in the future. We okay, have great. The, the results already. And I tell you, they're very interesting. Let me show this slide. Oh, let me go to this screen. This is the screen that I, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me show this one. Can you see this, um, Karen? Yes, we can. And it's the, the spreadsheet. And each one of these pawns has been shown, and you see the matching. Can you see my my pointer as well? I do not see your pointer. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'm just. I I was seeing his pointer. Oh, are you okay? okay. Oh yeah, now I see it. Okay. So each one of these pawns, uh, the numbers are matching the numbers in the in the graph, and you see that most of them are <laughs> the number one, which was no littorals. Um, but the water is crystal clear, well, clean, and there's no filamentous algae growing around the pond. So that's the most common pond that we have. And the least common is the one that has the littorals, beautiful gardens. That's the, and then also the ones with riprap all the way around with a bubbler. So yes, I can see, and quite abundant, the one that is nice littoral shells on the side with beautiful, those are many cases that I'm glad to see that. Um, those two, number one and two, happens to be the most common uh, of all. And I can see where you're right, filamentous algae, it's probably the number one as far as the microscopic algae problems that we are encountering. Um, there's different ways to treat that, and most companies will apply chemicals, including copper sulfate, chelated copper, or hydrogen peroxide base, uh, chemicals and those will be controlling that filamentous algae. The problem is that once you kill it, the nutrients will be released and then it will take a few weeks later for the same filamentous algae to come back. And I've seen that many times and it's sadly 
that is uh, an ongoing thing. Can, how can we reduce that? And that's where the conversation will come into place, like where we are the benefits of the littoral plants, because the littoral plants will hide that and they will allow that to be doing the filtration that we need. So in that case, let me move on to the next slide. And we can still come back again if we have some comments. And that's the question, that, and we're pretty much wrapping up with the final on this. Can the pond be functional and beautiful? And I think the answer is yes. And many ponds has proved that to be the case. Um, we just have to have a little more conscious about how different components play a role on that pond. And we can probably adjust this. This is like uh, gardening. I mean, you see where things are happening and you, if you take care of that earlier, then we'll be able to adjust things and not let it go and expand and have the problem, serious problem later on. I would like to now open the opportunity for comments, questions, and more. And this display that I have here is pretty much hand, handling the, I mean, presenting the fact that littoral plants are the center of the issues that can be the solution to control erosion, water quality, the fertilizer and pest control, because you might have some filtration with the littoral plants, uh, increases the value of the property, the property value, and then they and can reduce harmful algae. Um, and then wildlife, the birds will love it. So, hey, Ernesto, um, Robert from Gulf Harbor made a comment that says, we have just built many of the approaches to our ponds to improve the slopes or install stacked rocks that's rebuilt. Um, and, and Marlene was wondering, do you know how much Gulf, Gulf Harbor spent on that restoration? Maybe Robert could talk to us about it. Yeah. Robert just wrote in the chat, 6.6 uh, .6 million. 6.6 yeah. .6 million, wow. Well, that was mostly to uh, rebuild the golf course. Uh, the golf course was, uh, the grass was taken off the golf course uh, and uh, it was rebuilt from the uh, irrigation system up. But while they were doing that, <clears throat> they also paid attention to the, uh, the uh, shorelines of the lakes so that we could improve the slopes so that we could plant the littorals that would survive. Uh, our lakes uh, had drop-offs so that you had very little uh, littoral shelf to plant with uh, plants that uh, could thrive, uh, like some of the ones in your pictures, Ernesto. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, by adjusting the slopes, when we had all of that heavy equipment around that was rebuilding the golf course, it really didn't cost very much additional money to improve the lakes so that we could also improve the look of the lakes over time. Correct. Correct. In fact, there is there are several alternatives and I'm going to let um, Andy present later in this uh, webinar directed to the design of the pond, the different alternatives to maybe fix erosion problems because uh, they're all costly and they all go in different ranges there, but there are possibilities. The only thing that will not work, and I heard many times, is just pumping the, the muck from the bottom and just putting up there. And because the water and the, the erosion is not going to be, it's going to be washed out right, right after. No one lasts another year and all that money that is spent there doing that, it will be gone. It will be wasted pretty much. Uh, Ernesto, thank you. And yes, I was just going to say in general that the cost can vary widely on what is done anywhere from $25 or $30 a lineal foot along the pond bank to well over $100 a lineal foot. And yes, if, if, if the materials just move from the bottom of the pond back up onto the side bank and nothing else is done, uh, I've seen that go away in as little as two weeks. The heavy rainy, rainy season, yeah. And what about the potential for uh, contaminated soil from that muck? Is that a concern, Andy? 
generally it's not looked at from a regulatory standpoint as a concern in that yes if you have some contaminants in the bottom soils and you move them up to the side it's still in the same pond it's still it's not going anywhere oh. now if if some of those contaminants become dissolved in the water and discharge through your discharge structure there could be a problem but that can also occur from the bottom sediments themselves So on a, on a golf course, um, you know, there's certain places that that you worry about the most, you know, and it's mostly on the greens and places like that. So whoever whoever did the work knows that and usually, you know, makes some provision for keeping uh, pollutants out of the water. There's one pollutant that I'm concerned about, and it will be the copper. Copper has been used many, many times in all ponds, especially ponds that are like aging, I mean, talking 20 years, and the constant application of copper sulfate to control the filamentous algae we were talking early. So that has been in the, embedded in the soil. And an analysis of that soil will reveal how much copper is present. And not, but you're right, Andy, that can be stay in the site uh, but it is, is one of those heavy metals that might be part of the problem uh, because those metals are going to be bonding uh, or in, impairing the growth of beneficial bacteria who are associated with littorals. So you might not have any littorals around the pond because the filamentous algae was treated with copper and the copper has been embedded in that soil and then the cup the, the plants are not going to grow because of the copper impairing the bacteria associated with the roots of the plants so hey ernesto we have a comment from one of the residents at pepper tree point they said that the condos and houses are built too close to the pond to reduce the pepper tree point slopes from the three on one slope we corrected our erosion by spending $162,000 for about 5,000 linear feet of shoreline using GFTs. Those are geo tube, I believe. GFT, correct me, Andy, if I'm wrong, but a geo, geo tubes are bags that has been filled out with the muck on the bottom of the pond. It's then a diver, and the diver pumps those, fill the bags, and the bags are being completely protecting the shoreline. Is that right, Andy? Yeah, it's more of a tube than it is a bag, but yes, that's the concept. Okay, and then, yes, and I remember Pepper Tree Point doing that, and, and then one thing that they, after the job is done, sod has been placed on top of those bags, so you don't see the bags exposed. The problem is that if you leave the, the shoreline where the bag goes, and then there's just a little bit of sand, uh, soil, trying to cover in those those bags, if you let it exposed by not having any littorals protecting those bags, you end up having the erosion and then the bag will be showing and they call it bull nose. It's like, <laughs> it's like a little black nose of a bull because the, the all the erosions have been gone, the bag remains there. And then even you can have some animals who are like tilapia making trying to opening holes in those bags and you have the hole now in the bag and, and the bull's nose. Yeah, so littorals had to come along with the actions of the erosion fix, whatever it is. So Ernesto, do you think that if some, if plants other than sod were planted in those GFTs that there might have been a, a better result? Not on the plant, on the bags itself because the roots will not go through the bag. The, the bags are pretty solid and they, but in the front, right where the water starts, and that will be the good place to put the littorals that are, they can stand being and protecting that portion of the where the bag is finishing right into the water line. And you think that those littorals would block the wave action that would erode the sod oh, in yeah. the geotubes then? Oh yeah, I've seen them okay. many times. In yes. fact, one of my pond watch. I'm sorry, Andy. Go ahead. I was just going to say yes. That's that's the one of the bigger uh, improvements using littorals is to block those small waves that occur 
sometimes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that causes a lot of that vertical erosion along the, the pond bank. Yeah, in fact, I got examples, pictures before and after. Um, Heritage Palm has done a tremendous work and then they protect the shoreline with the littorals after the geotube was in place. And at, at, the, at, at this point, they're still standing there. And that was like 10 years ago. And, and I'm very glad to see that that money was invested well. Yeah, so our resident from Pepper Tree Point said they only put sod on top of the GFTs. I can't tell that resident's name because they have just initials, but if you're interested in talking, you, you know, we'd be happy to have you unmute and give us a little more detail if you're interested. One thing if I might add, Ernesto is um, on the on the top, you're pretty well stuck with going with sod as far as top of the uh, geotubes. You have to have something covering that geotube, otherwise um, the UV rays will actually break down the, the tube. Mm -hmm. um, I know other communities that have tried to put um, littorals in the tubing itself, and what ends up happening, you have to cut holes in the tube, yeah. and that causes all sorts of problems. Um, if you put littorals, like you're saying, in front of the tube itself, it has to be done immediately because of the fact that um, if you don't do that, you're going to have an escarpment that, develop, that develops in front of that tube, which will actually put you out of compliance. So that's a good point as far as what Ernesto is saying. You have to immediately put those littorals in front. Usually, you know, any spike brush um, and uh, pickerel weed, because normally that water is fairly deep. It just depends on how, how it was put, built. All right. All right. Hi, this is Jim Van Hoosen from Pepper Tree Point. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Uh, you really don't want to poke holes in GFTs because you're going to damage them over time. Now, what we put over the top of them to protect them from UV rays is we put a filter fabric, uh, basically almost like a silk uh, uh, fencing type fabric over the top, which will decay over time, but will be cheap to replace versus replacing the GFTs. But Ernesto is correct about the bullnose. And over time, uh, erosion on the face of those GFTs uh, did create uh, kind of a drop off. But our biggest problem, again, is that three on one slope. And actually, the GFTs have kind of contributed Additionally to it, we've spent uh, probably $10,000 on littorals and very spotty results. Yeah. Jim, do you know what chemicals your lake management company is using to control weeds around your stormwater ponds? Yes, uh, glyphosate, uh, chelated copper, uh, and off the top of my head, there's a third one. Oh, Diquat they, they use. But those weren't, at the beginning, uh, our littorals got attacked. We used to have grass carp, mm -hmm. and it seemed like the grass carp always liked the littorals we were planting. That didn't work. And then even when we put... Uh, fencing in front of it to protect the littorals uh, even over time because the slope is just too gone, doggone uh, steep. Do we lost them? No, I'm still here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Good. Thanks Good. for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Molly asks, what are some ideal littorals to help mitigate shoreline erosion? That's a good question. In fact, um, they, they, there's a whole list that are littorals that are beneficial and they grow fine in Southwest Florida. And some of them are highly recommended, um, especially the ones who have flowers because that beautiful flower will help 
convince the homeowner association that it is the right thing to do because it beautifies the site. Um, now, other other uh, companies might suggest some because they're very um, easy to propagate. And I'm not so pleased with this. I have my own personal preference, like Spartina, which is just a grass and mooly grass. I mean, they're fine above the ground, but they're not standing in the water where we actually need the protection. Um, we'll have in the next um, seminars um, examples of pickerel weed. Um, we, you can also find some website, I mean, um, yeah, where they recommend that. But in our website, wetplant.org, you can see some videos where homeowners have put together uh, those plants and they're showing there. In fact, we will have those available. If you go to that website on the resource, you go to videos and you can see there, there are some videos that talk about planting and how to propagate some of those plants. Golden Cannas is another one. It's a very, very, the one that I showed with the bee was going, those are Golden Cannas. Um, Mike mentioned that about spike rush. That's a great plant. Golf courses use a spike rush because the spike rush grows by itself, expands them, they, their own. They tend to colonize neighboring areas. And the spike rush itself doesn't grow tall like a cattail, so you won't have that impediment of vision because of the tallness of the plant. Um, and it's a great break for the wind. Ernesto, one thing I'd like to comment about is when we're talking about littoral plants or any plants along water, since water can transmit seeds and, and cuttings of plants so easily, uh, we, we would strongly recommend only native plants. If you start introducing exotics around these water bodies, sometimes it can take decades for us to realize that an exotic plant is uh, invasive. So it's best to stick with native plants and to make sure and buy only from reputable vendors to know that they are native plants. Correct. I wanted to add one more because I am so glad you bringing up the, the exotics that you will find that can, after the plant has been in, in place, the littoral plants that you, that are all there, beautiful. You have some invaders who come right after that because they see the opportunity. Torpedo grass is one of very invasive, uh, is very prolific and can cover and smother your nice, beautiful plants that you had there. Another one is alligator weed. And those two are exotics who are, can be under control, but they have to be quickly addressed because if you let it go, you're trying to spray those, you're gonna have collateral damage. And I highly recommend to keep an eye on those and having the companies who did the maintenance come back and remove the exotics because they know which plants are the bad ones and which ones are the good ones. Even teach the, the, the community because that could be just done, you know, um, as, as gardening. So, Ernesto, I was going to add that on the plants, you may want, if you're not sure which ones will grow best, may want to choose two or three or four and intermix them and then let the soils and the plants figure out on their own which ones will do best in your pond. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Look, look at doing that, like, like a testing with the different type of plants and see how they they uh, accept the, the conditions that you have. That is a great idea, correct? So Michael Fleming is asking, when is the best time to plant littorals? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Right now we're going into the dry season, although we still, Florida has usually a, a wet, long wet season. So the high, the water is still high, but in most, some ponds, the pond level will drop. And as you drop in that, there will be less opportunities for those plants. If you plant that right now, it's gonna go into the dry season. So I'd rather wait until March, April, when the waters might be going up again, and then to start doing the planting. Um, although if you have a pond that doesn't fluctuate so much, then you're fine. Uh, but then also realize that in the cold season, there will be some cold times and the plants will might go senes. And the senescing happens on the winter, but then the spring comes back, they will flourish. So you might see the plant is dead, but it's dormant and it will come back again. 
pickleweed does that a lot, and you see it in the ditches on the side of it. <laughs> colonial and you see they're all gone and also they come back again in the spring is because they, they were dormant seeds on the in the ground. Well that's all the questions I have on the chat. Okay. Is there anyone on online who'd like to unmute and, and ask a question? I think we're doing a phenomenal time because right now we're just finishing the last portion. In fact I'm going to advance to the last to thank everybody for participating and to one more time um, advertise the website, webplan.org. We'll, we'll adding, in fact, let me go and show back there. If I may go and stop the share, let me do this, stop the share here, and then go back and, wow, I need to close this so I can see where I am. <laughs> I lost my track of everything. See? Oh my goodness, now I really made it. Uh, so <laughs> I'm trying to find myself back and I lost my, okay, okay. So yeah, now I got it. So share, I just did a wrong turn on it. And I, I want to go back to the website. Yes, one more time. Yes, now we can see the website. So on the resources and how are we doing, Karen? Can we see the website? We can see it. Good. So on the resources, you might see that we have videos, which I'm going to click there just to, to, and then of course the website right now is clicking. So it's slowly moving into, and each one of these websites, by the way, I want to thank every, uh, all my pond watch volunteers have contributed by talking about their experiences in their pond. So welcome to come and see them. We're going to add more. We have a whole plan of getting some more information regarding that. And here and same in the website, you can find the workshops, which is the place where we are gonna post here, the future um, events. Right now, Andy Tilton is coming for the next one in, in November. And then we'll have in December, the ones with aquatic plants, fantastic things. And so we'll be presenting here and also we'll have another uh, a link to the recording of this event. And um, yeah, I think, and this by the way has been a great um, website that has been sponsored by a grant by given to the uh, human resource, not human, natural resources from the Lee County Natural Resources. It was a great achievement that it was done because we have now the opportunity to present and then interact with, um, with the homeowners who are interested in learning more about ponds. Um, Pond Watch is available for anybody in Lee County to bring samples. By all means, participate, um, bring samples, be part of the, the solution. And talking to the homeowner association sometimes is the hardest thing. But if you are part of the homeowner association, invite them to come and see this because they, they, there's a whole new um, opportunities to learn and to do stuff and minimize the cost. I think that's where we, we need to go. Minimize the cost and then expand the possibilities for each one of these ponds to be sustainable and to have less requirements for maintenance. So, hey, Ernesto, S. Putnam asks, can wet plan videos be located on our community's website sites as a resource for residents? And I would say the easiest thing to do with that is put on your website a link to the wetplan.org, to the right to the video page. Correct. and to the workshop page so that people can see the upcoming workshops and the past ones as well. That's right. And most of these are already, um, um, has our YouTube. They're in YouTube, so you can probably go there and even download it. I don't want right. to play it right now because they have a, yeah, they have a limitation on, but then you can see them. And I want to apologize to everybody for, because the quality is not like, oh my goodness, it's, it was done, I'm a, I'm an amateur filmmaker, so I'm just trying to do the best for the resources I have. We're trying to improve, and we will improve, but it's the message. Trying to see it as, a, okay, little tiny jewels that you find in the, in the forest. That's what I can advise about this. And I think we're pretty much wrapping to lunchtime. And I'm sorry we don't have any future, uh, food available. Usually we have hors d'oeuvres and drinks, but um, it's on your own. 
to go to have a little snack of food for lunch. And I want to thank everybody again, Karen, Andy, Molly, Marlene, um, Maria, Lisa Krager, oh my goodness, she's there too. And I want to thank everybody for being participant. Um, we'll be having this again next month. Um, I hope we catch up and then, well, if it is, it's a great way and you can send some people to, to, uh, to come and invite us, um, being invited. Um, again, want to thank everybody and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, Thank Ernesto. You. Great job. Thanks, Thanks Thank everyone. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. Thank you, Ernesto. Great job. Hey, thank you, Steve. Thank you, I'll, I'll slow my hands next time because you can barely see them <laughs> disappearing. <laughs> oh, Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording now. Have okay. a great day, everyone.